Thank you for coming. I'm Sophia. I'm a Scala developer at ITV now. Um, and yeah, and I'm Dave. I'm a consultant and I'm a trainer at Underscore. And we're here to talk to you about adopting Scala. So Dave and I met last year at Ux Netaporte. Um, I've recently left and Dave's still there. Um, Dave came <laughs> what? Dave came in to teach us Scala. We were brand new. There was two Perl devs, two graduate um, people off the graduate scheme, and we were learning Scala for the first time. So Dave came in to help us. So we're here today, hopefully, to give you a kind of framework you can follow to learn it yourselves. A little bit about Netaporte, just for some context. It's now part of Uke's Netaporte group. We're an online fashion retailer, and, well, I say we, sorry, <laughs> they. Um, and all the software there we worked on was developed in-house. And it was written in Perl, but we were working on getting it into some Scala microservices. Again, some context. Our team was formed the middle of last year. Again, as I said, four developers at the beginning. And we wanted to scale really quickly using Scarlet, so we hired Dave to help us. It was really useful. It helped us become confident and proficient within around two months, I'd say. Obviously, there was still a long way to go, and they're still learning Scarlet today. So, yeah. Uh, again, even more time scale for you. After about a year, we had eight developers there. We had about five microservices and just under about 100,000 lines of code. So we, yeah, we did, we did quite well. WC minus L. <laughs> um, yeah, so from my point of view, um, uh, coming into this as a, as a, as a trainer, uh, I was trying to sort of help bootstrap the team. So the way we typically do this is we start off with some classroom courses, but we quickly move on to learning as you go. Uh, because people learn better when they're working on stuff at the same time. So that's what this talk is going to be about. It's going to be fairly non-technical. It's about teaching and learning processes. Um, so for this particular uh, involvement, I was in two days a week, and um, you had three days a week to sort of... Um, figure it out. Figure out all the stuff and solve <laughs> as many problems as you could. And yeah. then if and there's anything left problems. over, yeah. I'll sort that out. So we're going to talk about a couple of things today. Um, we'll start off with some fairly lightweight stuff, uh, motivational stuff to set a framework. So we're going to talk about the motivations for adopting Scala, which hopefully uh, everyone here is, is on board with, a uh, way to sell Scala within your organization. We'll talk about the goals for the transition process. So how can we know that we're getting a good transition to the language? And then we'll talk a little bit about um, how we sort of did the learning of Scala and what worked well for us and what didn't work well. Um, and we'll finish off with a bit of a fun sort of what to expect, a couple of mm -hmm. top tips um, <laughs> there. Yeah. So, oh, this isn't working. Oh, it's not on. It's not on? Okay. There we go. Oh, it's on? Okay, so, so this is me. Right, sorry. We, we, we've sort of reallocated these slides. So we're going to start with these motivations for, for, for learning Scala. So um, there are a few reasons you might swap to, jump, jump to Scala in your organization. First one, oh, illustrated with dogs as well. <laughs> uh, performance, obviously. The JVM is very fast. Scala is a very fast language. We get a lot of performance out of it. Um, yeah, so it's a really reliable thing with the great static type system. You can use it to eliminate bugs. Less time spent on fixing bugs, the more times you get to work on features and really cool things. And yeah. uh, we, uh, we had a bunch of powerful libraries, so I'm sure a bunch of you are using Spark and Acker and things like this. And these are written in Scala, so it's very uh, low uh, impedance. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people find it really familiar. So it's close uh. to Java. It's not Java, but it's close. Um, it has familiar syntax. Things like the IDEs we use, we can keep using, the monitoring, the logging. Things like this, the continu continuity makes lives easier. <laughs> yeah, 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 something like that. <laughs> it's, just a, it's a familiar, faithful hound. That's what it is. Um, does everyone agree with those four points? Does anyone not agree with any of them? Okay, I was expecting some people to have the familiarity being similar to Java things to raise a few heckles here and there. Um, really what these are all are is, and I'm sure you know this dog, uh, all these, the, the, these are, are, are sort of proxies for increasing our productivity. So whether we're spending less time optimizing things because the code's running fast, or we're spending less time debugging yeah. things yeah. because it all works nicely because we have static types, we're basically increasing the amount of time we have to work on new features. So if we're going to measure the success of a transition to Scala, we're going to have to have some kind of metric for productivity here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Dave thought it was a really good idea to use charts. So these are really charts. good charts. Charts. Um, 
these are really good for identifying our goals. Um, so yeah, it's how, Sorry. Oh, you, you, you go, I'll, I'll stop yeah. advancing the slides. <laughs> it's, it's, it's compulsion. Uh, so before the transition to Scala, you're fairly productive, you're consistent, you know what you're doing, you keep going. Uh, what we'd like to see in an ideal world is to pick up a new language, get instantly more productive. But I think a lot of us know this is quite naive. H hands up who thinks this is naive. <laughs> <laughs> We kind of prompted you to, to think that, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, when we learn a new language, you know, you're, you're leaving some knowledge behind, you're learning some new stuff. So performance can take a little bit of a hit. So it looks a little bit more like this. We adopt Scala, performance drops, gradually move back up and become really productive and benefit from that. Everything gets better. Yeah, so the orange part is our, is our fall behind in productivity and hopefully that green part is a big surge um, with all cool new stuff. So. It will go on forever. Yes, so the, the, the ideal would be to minimise this lag time and maximise the long-term benefit and these are kind of, yeah, yeah. at odds, yeah, at yeah, odds so with each other. Yeah, so we've got these two goals for our transition. Yeah. But can, is anyone sort of, is everyone on board that these two are kind of opposed to one another? Is anyone not on board with that? Mm, it's not very it's obvious. Good. It's not very obvious. There is, yeah. there is. I, I, I feel fairly strongly in this that the, 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 the quicker we make our transition, the less benefit we're going to get out of, uh, out of the language long term mm. because we have to spend time learning it. So we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, there are a few. This is me. Good. There are a few <laughs> things um, that we can use to sort of inform this, um, to sort of uh, justify this and, and inform it a little bit things to do with how we learn. So some very, very lightweight sort of psychology stuff where we've removed most of the details. Oh, look at this fella. <laughs> um, the first insight is it does take time to learn. Okay, so there's a sort of a, a popular but uh, misguided belief that you can solve things with training. Um, oh, we've got to learn Scala. Let's just get everyone in a classroom for like a week and a half and, and when they can learn everything, all the advanced concepts and we just dump it into their brains and they'll be brilliant Scala developers and off we go doesn't happen. A day and a half, two days into training, everyone is tired. Their minds have switched off. Much like after two days of a, a, a conference, <laughs> I guess. Um, and there's only so much we can take in a, a, a time, and it's something to do with sort of short-term memory and long-term memory and, and sort of saturating and not being able to remember things. So it takes time to learn stuff, and we need time to reinforce that. And we reinforce it by actually doing it. Similar to that, there's a difference between knowledge and an, an application. <laughs> so for example, I can, I, can, uh, I can tell you all about monads, right? I can tell you about why monads are great, what the type signatures look like. Um, I can give you four or five examples of monads that you can use day to day. You can know this. People can ask you about monads and you'll be able to eloquently tell them how great monads are and why they should care. Something to do with burritos mm -hmm. or something. And then um, <laughs> The problem with that is then when you go sit down and refactor a bit of monadic code or try to make code more monadic, you'll go, oh my goodness, this is actually quite hard. Because there's a difference between knowing the principles and actually being able to apply the principles. I mean, both of these are important, right? I mean, we don't want that dog to be using that chainsaw without having read about it first. But <laughs> um, we, we can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. um, and following that, people learn at different rates. So. Um this isn't an intelligence thing. It's not how smart you are. It's a little bit to do with how much knowledge you have, how much you have to leave behind, how much you have to learn, um, stuff that we're familiar with, as we've already talked about. Um, and also, everyone is really different in this regard, too. So Scala is a hybrid language. It's, yes? What makes you so confident that those minds would ever grow beyond the budget? Uh, we're going to talk about how we can bring those together uh, above the dotted line. Uh, you're the okay, so the, 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 it's yeah. important that we learn the right features of our language, and this is sort of the thing we're driving towards here, right? So um, we'll come back to that in a couple of slides. I, I will remember it. And if I don't remember it, hold me to it. Hold me to it. <laughs> yeah, so Scala is a hybrid language. Uh, language. There's half about um, object oriented, half of, that's him, not me, uh, half functional programming. Most people are kind of comfortable with object oriented. It's easy for, go on. Who was in an object oriented language before they started doing Scala? Wow. Great, who was in a functional language before they started doing Scala? Okay, 
That's okay. pretty much what you expect. Exactly. So the object orientated side, people are a bit more comfortable with. Um, most people don't know that much functional programming, um, particularly the statically typed um, for functional program with functors and monads and all the scary words everyone talks about. So, scary. <laughs> but uh, some people have experience, it, uh, experience with it from their own interests or from university. So that again is going to uh, diverge the lines a little bit more, they'll and they'll take to it naturally. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this is picturing people on the same page, either in the the program that they're programming now or when they're starting to learn the basics. And as we learn Scala, these tend to diversify. This is great as long as there's this overlap in the middle and also that they have a future aim or, or a common understanding of what good code is. This diversity, the, the, the bits on the outside, is what leads to the creativeness and the, 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 the inspiration. So loads of advantages in that. We can train each other. Train well. each other, um, yeah, communication, yeah. everything like that. So. Next, though, is the negative side. So if these push out a little bit more, we allow people to go off and do their own thing. Yep. That's great, but there's, there's, there's going to be a dysfunction there, which isn't so great. If person A is writing code that person B doesn't understand, it, it, it creates a divide within the team. So this isn't great, and we have to work to avoid that. So, so there's, like, there's that guy, right? The Always guy. that guy. Always that guy. The Scarlet Z guy. Um, when I say guy, I mean maybe a girl. Sorry, maybe a girl. Yes, yeah, sorry. That's um, true. So, uh, yeah, we actively encourage the collaboration. So we need this to come together. We need this to be the ideal picture, I guess. Um, we still get the diversity, this outside space. You all get the time to be creative and um, inspire one another. But the strong common ground in the middle is really, really important for a team to learn and be great. So. Yeah, and hopefully the team can encourage build that common ground yeah. so that there's one more one more Ooh. thing yeah. uh familiarity yeah. is not equal to similarity i didn't have a good dog picture for this <laughs> um i added the dog pictures I, yes, I didn't mind it's, it's a it's a thing um this is really trying to get back to what uh, your question was about there um there's there's a difference between something looking familiar and something actually really sort of working the way you expect it to so for example, who's heard this phrase, Java without semicolons? Yeah, we've heard it a lot this, this last few days. So this is, this is a thing, right? This is a, something that in some ways is a very positive thing. If you're switching to, to Scala, particularly from Java, you can make a very e easy transition to yourself, right? You, you take, oh look, some Java code. Uh, you take some Java code that looks like this and you sort of, you know, you write the types after the variable names rather than before and you use val, var, and def, um, and you produce Scala code that works and does the same thing. And that means you can get up and running really quickly. Uh, but there's a trade-off there, right? If you actually spend time to learn the functional programming concepts, the other half of Scala, uh, then you, know, you get much better results. So there's a very di di distinctive trade-off here. And the real sort of crux of this process is trying to front load enough knowledge that we get the benefit without spending forever wallowing in type theory. Mm-hmm. So uh, these are the these are the sort of summary of the insights we had. Yeah. And um, yeah. So we learned that there's a trade-off between adopting quickly but getting the benefit from Scala. Uh, it's good to learn while we work, so it's really important to absorb that information, and it's really really great to learn from each other too. So. Sorry, I, I kind of went ahead with Butted that point in. for you. Yeah, no, um, so okay, so this is what we're kind of coming on to here. This is what this talk is about. It's processes for learning and teaching. And we're, we're really interested to hear your thoughts about this as well in a minute. Um, it turns out that there's um, a lot of uh, sort of overlap. Well, OK, no, let me, uh, let me, let me first of all, let's ask you. If, uh, if you're the only Scala expert in your organization, right, and I say to you as your boss, go and train everyone else in Scala, what would you do? Right? And I'm sure there's some people in here who've had that happen. You're, you're the person who's sort of leading this charge. Go and train everyone else internally. You probably think, okay, well, I went to school. I learned programming at school or at university, and I did a lot of lectures, and I did a lot of courses, and I did some exercises. And that's what you probably do. You probably produce that content. And that's fine. That works. That's a great, uh, a great way of doing things. But there are some really great sort of uh, training tools that we can actually, that actually improve on that a lot more. So... Here are some of the sort of things you see coming out of uh, 
uh, of sort of educational literature these days. The sort of uh, you know collaborative learning and feedback. Has anyone heard the phrase mastery learning? So when you keep working on something until you're actually good at it, as opposed to being forced to move on to the next part of the syllabus. It actually helps people learn things better. Um, but there's, there's a lot of great sort of things. Understanding the way you learn yourself, that's a, a really important thing. And, and what's interesting about the, these, these things, which seem kind of obvious, is that when put into practice, they have a really significant effect. So you're talking about things that cost nothing, that are putting people months ahead, or giving them multiple grade differences in their final sort of exam results. And what's great about these approaches is we're already doing some of them, right? Because there's a lot of overlap between these and, uh, and some of the, print, the processes we use in agile development and some of the processes we're do using in stuff like sort of the software craftsmanship movement. So we can put those to use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and so we're going to talk about a couple of things that, that we've been using here technique-wise. Each have got pros and cons. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll go into the cons as much as the pros. And we, we'd <laughs> like to get your opinions on this stuff as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Oh, still God, I'm, I'm still, still going. Okay. Um, training courses. So I guess, I guess uh, we've already talked about training a little bit. The advantages of a training course is it'll dump information. The disadvantage is there's only so much information you can absorb. So you, you, you have to, um, there's only so far you can go with them. Good training courses will tell you what's important so that when you actually go away to work on this stuff yourself, you're not, you know, you're not, you're not uh, uh, thinking about things that are actually not relevant to what you're going to be using day to day. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, from my experience and my perspective, um, exactly how Dave said, it's, it gets really draining. You feel like you've learned too much. It feels like your brain can't take anymore. Um, it's really good to get away and absorb it. And, and the way that you do that is to put it into pra practice. Dave talked about a one day short term. Was it one day to about, take? About a day or two, supposedly, or short term memory, yeah. Um, so, so get it in, get the practice in. Um, yeah, absorb it. That's the only thing I can kind of say to Well, there's an interesting thing here, which is um, a lot of people organize training courses on Thursday and Friday. End of the week, let's do a training course. Mm. And by the time you yeah, get back on Monday, point. you've lost that window, right? That window is like a day long, and you, you want to get out there and try to start playing with this stuff. So if you take two days off and start thinking about, you know, washing the car or, or whatever, <laughs> it's not going to help. Yes, so... Um, the next one is a bit of a chat about peer review. It's things you can do on the job that help you learn. So peer review is a great one. You've done a piece of code, you want to get your peers' opinion on it. It's great for um, sharing the, the, the stuff that you've done. It's great for encouraging conversation and discussion. Um, one of the easiest ones is to obviously do a code review. So one person signs off on the stuff you've done, or two even. This is great because it gets people involved in, from the team. Um, it encourages people to weigh in. <laughs> on the stuff you've done, if it's good, what they think. Um, but there are a number of downsides. Before I go to the downsides, I assume a lot of people here do pull request review. Who, who, who does, has a, a routine practice of pull request review at their companies? So interesting. So it's not everybody. It's like half. Yeah, I thought it'd be more than so, that. So um, for learning, it's a great... I mean, it's, it's great for quali tool for quality control, but there are a number of downsides to it, some of which hopefully you know, will be, be obvious, and some, some of which are specific to a learning context. So this is an interesting one. It's got to be inclusive, right? Particularly for learning. Mm, is, is, this that's is, really important. Uh, it, in some, some places, when peer review ends up being a process of the senior dev signs things off, which is kind of, okay, maybe that's the, the person with all the domain knowledge, but it's not good for learning because people get disengaged from it. And if you, you, you end up with sort of like, oh, well, I don't really know if this code is right or not, but I'll just submit the pull request and someone else will tell me mm. if it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and, and that, that's not a, a, a positive, um, it, it, positive environment. With regards to being positive about things, when you're switching a language as a team, it's a really leveling experience, right? All the people who previously had all their knowledge are now, you know, the senior devs now know as much as the junior devs. Um, and some of us are very proud about our work and it's very easy to become um, Defensive. Defensive, that's yeah. the word, yeah. So, you know, positive encouragement and all that kind of stuff. Keep it, write and read comments in a positive light. And then there's things like focus. So particularly coming from other languages, you'll have different, say, syntactic considerations. Putting underscores before private function names is like an example from JavaScript world, maybe. Um, those kind of things are kind of great in a peer review, but the, the fact of the matter is people latch onto the first thing they see. Um, and so one can get quite distracted by these things. Mm. So, like white so, space. 
white space oh boy yeah okay yeah and 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 things like optimize is this thing efficient is this is this yeah, is this yeah. for loop i know yeah. it's a flat map method that's not a, that's not a while loop right that's mm. less efficient that kind of thing um and and it's important to not capture that stuff at the expense of capturing all the really important stuff like does this code do what we designed it to do and are the tests actually doing the right thing and so on yeah uh, something that isn't on here as well um is that peer reviews can be really really difficult um seeing the code on on the page is really hard to spot those you know those little things or actually know that the code that you're looking at it might look right but does it do what the what the ticket or the or the task asked it to do so those kind of things are really hard to judge from a peer review too um so uh, i guess does uh, if, if if this becomes a problem with the indentation becomes a problem there are a few things you can use to help does anyone use stuff like scalariform yeah there's a few projects in there so this automatically formats your code mm -hmm. for you um, Scala stars a linter, water remover will you know, fail your build if you've used option.get and things like this. So there are tools here you can use to focus the discussion. They're not, um, they're, they're, they're sort of, some people love them, some people hate them, like everybody yeah. hates Scalariform. There's a, a <laughs> Sam Halliday has a really great phrase, which is like, nobody likes the indentation and the, uh, and the layout that Scalariform provides, but everyone hates it equally. <laughs> so you're all on the same <laughs> side, right? And that, that can hold, help solve some of these problems. Yeah. But, you know. uh, but right. on the other side. Yeah, your, your, uh, mileage <laughs> your mileage may vary. Your mileage may vary. These tools can be kind of annoying. They, they, they're restrictive. Oh, they're what? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the thing that we can say between us is just try them and see if it works for your team. It could work for you. It could distract from the, from the from, as you said, the boring stuff. So, yeah. Uh, next is a really controversial one, pairing. Um, I think I mentioned in the Scala Exchange pairing in my talk um, in December, and it was the only thing people commented on afterwards. So um, yeah, it's a controversial one. When it works, it's great. There's lots of knowledge transfer, there's um, productivity. Uh, you can really benefit from that connection. Um, and it gets people working together and conversation and discussion and everything great like that. However, it needs to be done so well. Uh, it needs to be done really well. So respect the driver and the navigator roles. It's really important. If you're the navigator, sit on your hands. Do not touch the keyboard. Do not touch anything. Try to explain things to people. Um, help them. They, yeah, help them. That's all the thing I can say. TDD works really well, I've noticed recently. Um, the whole green light, red light. Somebody writes a test and the other person needs it to pass. That's a great one to use. Uh, the benefit. Oh, go on. Do, do, do you want to do situ I mean, yeah, th go this ahead. is this is an yeah. interesting one. Like, uh, not you know, you can't mandate people to pair all the time. Sometimes it's just not applicable to a task. Someone wants to just sort of zone out and solve the problem. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's it's always worth. Um, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's always worth uh, 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 be able to just walk away from pairing if it's not helping anymore, right? You, you've you've gone through the problem. You discuss mm -hmm. the benefits. Okay, one person's going to finish this now. That's fine. And it's really hard work, particularly if you're doing it eight hours a day. So uh, uh, just a show of hands, actually. Who does pairing routinely at work? Okay. Oh, um, wow, more than the code reviews. More than code reviews. That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, and then who, who's a fan of pairing? Who's not a fan of pairing? Okay. Oh, wow. There's a few okay. hands either way, mostly in pro. That's great. The people who are doing it are also the people who like it, which is a really good sign. <laughs> okay. I think um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Because yeah, you realise the, the it's, bad parts. It's really easy to do it badly and get turned yeah. off it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll, I'll take this. This is this is the last big thing we did. We did a lot of this stuff. Um, so one of the things about um, uh, being uh, hired as a trainer as opposed to as a developer is that um, I've effectively got buy-in from the management to stop people programming if if it think it's worth it. So, it, you know, if, if a bunch of people are learning uh, Scala, maybe people are having trouble with futures. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's go away and learn about futures and then come back after an afternoon. Um, the net benefit of doing that and getting everybody on board together is a lot higher than the, the, the you know, not working on code for an afternoon. So having sort of a, a, a workshop type format where you can work on a problem together is really great. Now, there's two big differences between workshops and courses. One um, is they're short, so you're not hitting that knowledge saturation point. And the other one is that it's not really about teacher-student. It's about pairing and, 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 and doing stuff together and solving a problem and exchanging knowledge, which means it's really good for keeping everyone talking, keeping everyone on the same page. These two formats here both work very well. Uh, pairing and then sort of showing your work afterwards. Uh, I 
don't know how to pronounce this word. I think it's randori, randori. Randori, let's call it that. Uh, this is a format where you, you have a shared laptop and a shared projector, and basically everyone's working on the same piece of code together. Mm -hmm. The big thing about this is, unless the workshop is specifically to do with your work, well, yeah, then you can't require people to prepare for it. Everyone's always busy at work. You've got stuff to do. If you require people to prepare for a session and some of them don't, those people are just going to get nothing out of it. Um, so two things that work really well, uh, carters. So who knows what a carter is? There's a few people. OK, so yeah, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll explain for those who didn't put their hands up. It's basically a programming exercise. And the idea is you, you do it again and again and again and try different techniques. And you develop your craftsmanship. It's a, it's a software craftsmanship type yeah. term. And then this term, mob programming, which is essentially we've identified a fun thing to do in the code base. And everybody wants to do it. So let's <laughs> all do it together. And like refactoring, mob refactoring. These both both work really really well, and we had a yeah. lot of a yeah. lot of good benefit yeah. from them. I think Carter's is one of the things I've found that helps me the most. Is uh, maybe on my own, just keep you know attempting and getting better. Yeah. Um, one thing we didn't we found didn't work well actually. Good uh, pro anti tip was uh, uh, we would try to do the big red book functional programming in Scala. We were trying to do it as a book club, and we were trying to do the exercises and then come together and talk about any of the ones we couldn't do. It's, it's nothing to do with the book. The book is excellent, and it's, well, it's great for individual study. But we couldn't find a way of making it work in a classroom environment. If you'd done the work, you'd done the work. And you probably got the same answer as everyone else who did the work. <laughs> and if you hadn't done the work, then after a few chapters, people were just getting lost. Yeah. Um, there's a really great book on this, by the way. I, I, I thoroughly recommend this book if you have any interest in doing this kind of thing at work. Um, I think it's Emily Bakke, uh, The Coding Jojo Handbook. It's quite cheap. It's about 200 pages long. The first 100 pages is how to run these sessions, and the second 100 pages is a big list of carters, from fizzbuzz up to things that will last an entire day and longer. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Um, so before we finish up, we want to talk a little bit about what you should learn, maybe. Um, oh, yes. Yes, so there's a lot to Scala. We need to find a set of concepts that is <laughs> um, that are small enough to learn quickly, not too intimidating, <laughs> but uh, large enough to support you know, the work we do every day, our applications. No, Null's so. a part of Scala. <laughs> Exceptions are a part of Scala. <laughs> <laughs> at the bottom of the slides, so lots of people at the back can't see them. <laughs> um, so I found Coursera to be a really good choice. Uh, it's something I'm working through again now. I started doing it a bit before and come back to it. Um, it's free, especially. Uh, there's a specialization now too, I think was talked about earlier in the conference. And, and it's good to do together as well. It is a good one to do together. together. Yeah. And it's, it's not quite the same as a red, but where it's one exercise, it's, you know, you can actually talk through all the different things and stuff. Um, so that's great. So this is, I mean, the, and the idea here is basically pick a course and use it as your syllabus. So the, the syllabus for, 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 for Coursera is great. It'll guide you through your first moments of Scala. When we did this, we were, because it's an underscore thing, we were using the underscore stuff. So this, 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 these are two books here. Like, this is a free book, and this is not a free book. This is a really intro, in, introduction to Scala, and, and this is a sort of a, what you need to know as a commercial developer. Um, if you haven't tried Creative Scala, I'm, I, you know, if you haven't tried Creative Scala, the free one, check it out. It's really cool. You draw pictures, you learn Scala. It's not very deep, but it gives you that real kind of like what is functional programming kind of stuff. And if you're interested in, in you know, we have a, a good a, an approach which we're really proud of for Essential Scala about what's important. Um, you don't need the book. Noel gave a talk, my colleague Noel, who might be here somewhere, I'm not sure, uh, gave a talk last year um, at Amsterdam called Six Core Principles for Learning Scala, where he sort of goes through the principles we use, which are all very high-level uh, functional programming principles. None of them are actually unique to Scala. It's not things like implicits. It's things like type classes or algebraic data types. They have fancy, fancy names, but they're very simple concepts which you can use to um, really improve your applications. Mm. Okay. It was great for, for me to begin with because they're, they're, they're just, they explain things really well. Signposting, right? Sorry, Dave. I know you didn't want me to talk about it. <laughs> Quick, what to expect? Uh, um. uh, oh, sorry, you switched to. Um, so summing up everything so far, we set some goals for our language transition, talked about how we learn them, what it's like to be in that learning process, and the advantages of peer teaching. We talked about different learning techniques. Uh, we showed some useful resources 
Uh, and now we'd like to finish off on kind of the things that my team at the time experienced, me and myself experienced, and some fun tips and things like that. So. The first one is, it's okay to make mistakes. This is one of the biggest ones, I think. Um, every single person makes a mistake. Uh, it's okay as long as you learn from them and you plan the time in to make uh, to have them without, you know, fear of guilt. And convince your managers to allocate time yes. to allow you to make mistakes. Yes. It's, it's important. really important. You end up refactoring it anyway if you, if you don't like what you've done. Yep. So we used it with the first project. We made it really achievable. We made it um, really re representative of real work. So we got to know the stuff that we would be doing in real life. But most importantly, we allowed the time for the mistakes, which was really useful. Uh, whoops, uh, we see we've done it again. <laughs> Sorry. Simul simultaneous clicking. Uh, mouse wars. Yeah, the, the tip number two, we've talked about it before. Functional programming is a new thing. And you can't learn Scala without fun learning functional programming. I feel fairly strongly about this. Back in the day, uh, underscore was very much aligned with, uh, OK, just make the transition, do the Java without the semicolons, and then learn from there. These days, uh, a few years later, I've really come around on this, that you have to embrace those functional things early to avoid just basically just building legacy for yourself, right? You're just, you're getting no perceivable improvement and you're just writing the same code again. So it's worth embracing FP. <laughs> uh, as I said earlier, these are scary terms that you don't really need to worry about straight away. Um, just starting right, just start writing. And then later on when somebody describes these things to you, you're familiar enough to not be scared by them, I would say. That's the easiest way. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I... <laughs> Yeah, I modified your slide. He changes everything. Um, the, uh, so, so who um, who here knows what a monad is? Okay, yeah, right. So um, who's used flat map, a map? Okay, many more people. Okay, so um, th this, that's what a monad is. Ta-da! We all learned something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, the, I think the, the, the idea here is that the patterns exist, and we use the patterns, and we can learn the patterns. And it doesn't, the terminology is, is useful because it gives us precise definitions for what a thing is. But it is possible to just pile in, just, just write the code, and the concepts emerge. Yeah, be aware of it, but don't worry about yeah, it. Don't yeah, don't worry about it. Burritos. They're all about burritos. Um, is it me? <laughs> yes, it's me. It's you. Uh, okay, yeah, Scala is a, supports multiple styles. So, yeah, you can write a lot of different types of code in Scala. Um, a lot of people see this as a big disadvantage. In some ways it is, because you can go off in different directions. But it actually really helps if your team is communicating, because people are going to solve pro problems in different ways, and you're going to get the best of all worlds. So the fact that Scala is, a, Scala is a flexible language means that there is a good way of writing most code in it. And um, with everyone working together, you'll find that way. So just embrace it and, and don't worry too much about that. Yeah, we touched on this too. Uh, just be really aware that the, the, the person on the other end of the comments uh, is human, uh, that have worried about that code. It's rubbish. Um, <laughs> again, because there's lots of ways of writing things, people can disagree over some things that may not be that important. Is that controversial to say? I don't know. Um, Tabs versus spaces. <laughs> uh, but yeah, on the other end, don't be overprotective of the code. Try and think of it as the whole team is writing it. Um, the conversations that are kicked off by those kind of code reviews are really interesting and are important. But yeah, just remember, that be kind, be nice. <laughs> and the last fun tip, I guess, is experiment. Uh, but the, the idea here, actually, um, when we started, we wrote two microservices almost immediately, right? Yep, yep. Um, and, and the first was absolutely minute. It was a couple of thousand lines of code, and the next one was two or three times bigger. Yep. But we wrote them with different software stacks. And I think that's, that was really good, because it, it was very everyone good, got yeah. to see, like, OK, this is how, what's it, Spray, and this is how Play Framework work. And this is the difference between them, and this is what they, what they look like. And um, that gives you more tools for your tool belt rather than picking one tool, sort of like then just letting that stagnate. And then it may not, you didn't, may not have, have uh, not have made the right decision for your project. So uh, giving yourself more options early on really helps. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, and that is our last tip. So all the slides are here. This is us. <laughs> um, we have some image credits. I'm going to put them up on the slide because all, all these pictures. wonderful all. people, all dog pictures. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, we'll quite happily have a, a chat yeah, right now. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So I need to, I'm going to, um, is, is there a microphone person? Someone to, 
I think I think I want to pass the microphone on to the guy sitting in front of me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I think your question still hasn't been answered. How yeah. do you um, make sure that everybody gets above the dotted line? Right. Uh, because I think you're coming from Pearl, and yep. I can imagine. Oh, what was it you're coming from? I came from uh, university. Ah, okay. Well, the, the, yeah, so, so <laughs> that's different. <laughs> Next Porte is, was traditionally a Pearl house. They've been uh, moving to microservices for the last few years, and Scala's now fairly heavily used there. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so, all right. I think you have to. Okay, part of a language adoption is looking at a language and looking at the feature set of the language. So if we're assuming that functional programming is useful to your domain, because you've already looked and analyzed at that, and you're assuming that static typing is, is going to be useful to your main domain, then we have to have faith that those tools are going to pay off, right? And I think if you use those tools correctly, they will pay off. It's just, you know, the Scala fits certain niches, and uh, for example, like web development is a really good niche for it. Um, and so the benefits are there. And as long as you use those benefits, I think it's very, very, very likely that it will pay off. It may not. You may have a whole bunch of people who use Scala and hate it and want to move on. But it's, that's normally to do with misunderstanding the pros and cons of the language. I have a question. What do you do if there's someone who can't get up to speed? What do you do if there's someone who can't get up to speed? That's a tricky one, but the, you, people are normally not getting it because they're not having things explained right. So uh, the tricky thing about trying to show people a new programming thing is understanding why they don't understand something. So if you can, there's a, there's a sort of a, a technique, which is if you're, if you're training somebody, never ever answer a question with yes or no, right? It'd be really, really irritating. Um, always uh, try to ask them, or, or and never, Sorry, no, no. I got that. They asked you the wrong way around. Never ever ask them a question that can be answered with yes or no. Um, you ask them open questions and get them to describe things to you because the chances are that they've said, they'll say something like, I don't get futures. Right, just to pick up on a previous example. I don't understand uh, how we, you know, I, I don't understand is, is like the best possible thing. They have no idea why they don't understand. And by a process of repeatedly asking them questions and getting down, you'll find somewhere. In there, there is, a, there is a thing that they believe because of the previous model of programming that is, in, is inconsistent with Scala. So I guess there's, there's some slides we removed from here about the way we understand all this stuff is we have these big complicated maps of concepts in our heads, right? And they're all models. They're all approximate concepts. So we don't know how Scala compiles to bytecode unless we are one of the very few people in this room. We don't know how that operates. We don't know how the JVM operates. But we have a good model for how Scala operates in our heads. And if you were programming Perl previously, we have a good model for how Perl operates in our heads. And those, the model for Perl and the model for Scala overlap a lot, but don't overlap entirely. And where you've got a belief that like, you'll be from Perl, you're thinking, oh, this is the only way things work. Uh, and then you come to Scala, and there is something in there. You may not notice what it is, but there's an inconsistency deep within that. You have to find it and get rid of it. So I guess I've, I've rambled a lot there. But that's <laughs> a, question. <laughs> a question further back and here. We'll, we'll go here first, because you put your hand up first. Um, how do you pitch that functional programming is really something entirely different, or that? Uh, <laughs> Right, interesting. Um, so knowing what you can do with functional programming beforehand, you can produce nice, elegant pieces of code that are impossible to write without it. Is that <laughs> so I've, I've done a bit of pitching Scala before, in that uh, I've, I've, people sort of um, will say, can you come and talk to us about Scala and tell us why, why we should be interested in it? You know, sell us Scala. And uh, it's really weird, different things. A lot of people like. Um, Features like um, um, uh, extension methods. This is magic and new, but like it, it's about finding something which is difficult to represent in the language you had before that is is a common use case. So like the classic thing is you know using a function, mapping over something with a function where you previously had a language that didn't have a map construct or a convenient map construct, or uh, if you're coming from Java 8, doing something with a type class. It will normally blow people away. <laughs> Quite. Yeah. Take one of these. 
like not able to work for two weeks after that. Yeah. And I think it's very important. You, you address it. You have to be positive. Yeah. But I think it's very important that you do it well and that you train the guys that they don't have to know the language, but they have to be, uh, know the people. Um, no, I think it's really important. I don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't want everyone in your team to be great because everyone in your team contributes to the code that you write. Um, you're only going to get better software if you know everyone's, you know, good, uh, happy, happy. Importantly, um, was there anything you wanted? To I, it, it just that it's super, super duper important. I think cultivating a good, uh, healthy team dynamic, it's like, you know, having a positive team that works well together, it's something I don't actually, I don't under, I'm not good at it, it's not my core expertise, my core expertise is in teaching people Scala, but it's something that's really good, hard to do, and having a good manager who understands how to do that is, is really, really essential, and cannot be undervalued enough, um, cannot be undervalued enough, does that make it, yeah, I think that's the right way around. Hey there, um, what's your uh, experience and recommendation um, uh, to um, no, what, what was I asking now? Um, <laughs> yes, um, we are doing test-driven development in some way, but uh, our problem is um, that we have to convince our managers and even co-workers um, to write tests, even if we have uh, a pressure because uh, a release is uh, standing near. And I want to know what is your experience with this, and uh, what do you recommend? Um, so, I think the only way to answer these questions is with data. That's the only way you can really prove these things to people. So, um, we're all used to like measuring the number of story points delivered in a, in a sprint, or measuring the number of tickets delivered in a sprint. And we have to. We also know how many bugs we've solved in a sprint. And to be able to categorise bugs that were not caught by a unit test, or you know, uh, there's an obvious gap in the unit test. If you can capture that then over the period of a few sprints, you have some very compelling evidence. Because churn is really disruptive, right? It gets in the way and it stops you delivering features. So um, one of the things, again, that we, we, we cut a bunch of content from this talk because there's not enough time. But one of the things that um, it's, it's, it's really great if you can build it in, it's quite difficult to build in, but having some kind of uh, metric for uh, how far you're getting with your, you know, you're getting better with the language, you're learning more features, um, having a sort of a tickets in your, in your, in your Agile cycle for like, okay, let's master this concept and then can we use it again? It's all a matter of sort of being able to analyze your own process. And, and you know, it's just as hard as any of these other things, which are very hard. Uh, okay, we've got like three, we've got a couple of guys here at the front and one at the back. And yeah, we got loads You of showed time. the performance. Um, one year ago and now it should be better. Do you have special metrics to show your management that this is true, that you are really more productive with Scala than before with another language? That's a very good question. Um, if, well, one way you can do that, and so, so another thing which we didn't talk about is, you know, what's a good choice for a project, right? So we talked about this a lot. Um, and you know, there, there are, the, the nice things for your early projects are small projects which are stretching the team just a bit, but are achievable. And one of the things that really works well is if you have a fairly standalone piece of code that you've already got and you can re-implement it. And that way you can get a feel for how long it, you know, you know how long it took originally, you know how, how, how many bugs you get by that per unit time, and you can re-implement that in Scala and you can compare. Um, so if you have something like that, you do one of these things early on, you do one of these things late on, then you can do some direct comparisons. Apart from that, yeah, I don't have good answers. Does anyone else have any good answers? <laughs> well, that, that answer won't work because by the time you rewrite, you already understand the problem. So that's right. Required. Yes, okay, yes, that answer doesn't work because you already understand the problem. That's, that's, a, yeah, that's a good point. Um, gut feeling, I guess. Is there, is there, I know there are a couple of questions at the front. Do you still um, another one? Of <laughs> we'll come back to you in a minute. So you're, yeah, you're, I mean, for the benefit of uh, the recording, your, your question or, or comment was, was again about this, 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 this notion that um, you have a deadline, you've got to ship code, unit tests are code, it takes time to deliver unit tests, and you, there's a management decision to be made about how to allocate that time. There's also, um, I mean, another wider point about 
learning is that people don't learn well under stress. <laughs> so uh, you know, those horrible hacks that you know do in the programming language you knew beforehand to, to ship code will become abysmal hacks in Scala and, and uh, also become very difficult to unpick afterwards because you've probably skipped out on looking at the problem um, carefully when it was a small problem back in the day. So there's, there is a much wider context around this. I mean, I think there's, there's a big take home for, for any delivery managers here is that um, it, is, it is worth keeping initial projects short and allowing time to fail or allowing time to rewrite because um, the, 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 the typical way people will learn Scala is you'll learn a minimal subset that you need to, to write your application. So let's say you're writing a play application, you will learn so basic expression-oriented programming, how to write a class, how to write a, a case class and stuff. You'll learn about futures, you'll learn about JSON, and there you go. That's uh, maybe you'll bring in a database library. And that's your, that's your sort of minimal set. And then it's not going to include a whole raft of tools which will make the code a lot more elegant. So you're then going to want to refactor that later on, right? You go, oh my goodness, I found out about monad transformers. What was I thinking? Oh, you know. <laughs> Um, and you'll want to go back and, uh, and look at that again. And having time, having time to be able to look at that and determine whether it's worth rewriting is, is, is even is, is, is important. It should be really, really important for any delivery manager that the code that you write is stable and yeah, yeah and, and, and stand some kind of test of time to some point. Uh, yeah, so it's, it, it should be just as important for them that the code is stable. That's that's my point, is that they should be just as invested in that as you, as you I guess. That's yeah. Nice. But surprisingly difficult to see that when you're there, right there. Yeah, I think the, we all know this project. You have like a lot of pressure. You have the delivery date, the next one, and so on. And I think you just need some courage by the manager to say, okay, we, we do this delivery, and now we have to rearrange because we are on a bad track. And just admit yeah. it that you are on a bad track and get on a good track again and have some get some space to, to breathe again. Yeah. Which is also a good reason to set your goals smallish to begin with because then you have less of a, a rewrite on your hands. Um, I think, did I hear a bell go or something? Are we, how are you doing for time? Well, okay. I think that's probably all the time we have for questions. If anyone wants to come talk to us afterwards, please do. We're happy to talk as long as possible. Thank you very much.